I will tell you what, if you tell me in 2015 that in 2024, I will manage four and a half billion dollars and I will be a venture capital, I will laugh in your face. So would most people, yeah. yeah. I had the privilege to build, to meet both Elon and Jensen. And Elon told me a couple of, they had four or five times at Tesla with weeks in cash. And he was like begging to the states of California to give him a loan. And without that loan, there was no Tesla today. I've said there are the other things that I think people underestimate. We got super lucky. Luck is a big portion of this business. We got super lucky that our thesis became mainstream and you know, the largest companies in the world right now are full stack companies, right? Microsoft and NVIDIA, Tesla and Apple, they're all companies that, uh, I mean, if you're seeing uh, where Meta is spending most of their money is on hardware, uh, not actually on software. So the most software companies went to hardware. So we just got lucky that the thesis became mainstream. I had the privilege during this job to meet the CEOs of the largest companies in the world. And they do not need to give me, I'm nobody. They do not need to give me their time. And when I heard from them, their challenges around manufacturing and saw in their eyes what we are describing that they are doing, how it's going to impact the largest companies on the globe, I knew that we are touching a product market fit. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo, I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Well, Lior, welcome to the show. Thank you, Pablo. Great to be here. Dude, so I mean, look, I mean, like the first thing I want to ask you right off the bat is, I, you know, it normally takes like 110% of your attention to do a startup, to get any sort of traction in a startup. And then here I'm like reading about you and I'm like, okay, I got this bright machines thing, like, it seems to be doing well. You raised like over four hundred million dollars. You're a CEO, co-founder there, and then you got Eclipse Ventures, which is like four billion AUM. You just raised like one point two billion dollars last year, and you're the CEO and like founding partner there. What's going on, man? <laughs> like, just like, how are you making this happen? Hey, you know, Elon make uh, make everyone look so easy. I mean, you know, SpaceX, <laughs> Tesla, X. So who I am that I'm going? To, that's what I'm telling my wife. It's only two day jobs. Look, there is other people having seven, eight day jobs, and they're frankly doing well. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Maybe let's start a little bit on Eclipse. I mean, we'll talk mainly about Bright Machines today, but I think one one thing leads to the other. Um, even Eclipse like seems to be, you know, kind of this big zero to one moment. Like if you look at a lot of even the big funds, I mean, not the big funds, but like the early stage stuff, they start $10 million fund. Like for us at Mistral, first fund was $20 million. Your first fund was like, you know, $125 million, at least according to, uh, to Crunchbase. What's the story there? Like, how did you get that off the ground? Yeah, you know what? In some way, uh, um, the story of Bright Machines, uh, uh, myself, Eclipse, is uh, very much connected to each other. Uh, I was building companies inside Flex, and the origin of Bright Machine uh, started there. We'll talk about it later. And when I left uh, Flex because I want to continue to build companies, just wanted to do it on a standalone platform rather than inside Fortune 500, I knew that uh, I need capital in order to do it and went... Uh, uh, I always say the power of ignorance. I did not know what is limited partners. I did not know how hard it is to raise $125 million to your first fund fund. I did not know all of that. I'm like, great, I'm an entrepreneur. I raised money for my companies before. I'm sure I'll be fine. Uh, it was much harder than I thought. Walk me through maybe then your story. Like, So you mentioned Flex, Flextronics, which you know maybe you can tell us a little bit more about but that company. Obviously, the name is, is well known. But what what about before that? Or was that like, yeah, what was your kind of story before that? Yeah, I grew up in Israel uh, in the kibbutz community, um, joined the uh, special forces uh, uh, for my military. I was there a uh, um, bunch of years. Left in 2008 uh, to start a company with my young brother. Uh, we did the software defined network for the mobile carriers. Uh, Cisco bought the company in 2012. Uh, for 475 million and moved me uh, to the Bay Area. Now I was not the brain, it was my brother. So I was uh, just here for the integration. And in one of those meetings, I met uh, the CEO of Flextronics that was the main contract manufacturing of Cisco. And Mike uh, convinced me to join him and build for him the digital transformation team that will incubate tech companies inside Flex instead of uh, going back home. And I joined him for one year. I was there for more than three. And yeah, if the people that don't know who is Flextronics, it's like the American vor- version of Foxconn. So about 300,000 people around the world doing electronics manufacturing. What made you decide to join? Like most people who sell a business, either just go to the beach or start another business or maybe sometimes start a fund, but few will join another company. 
and work. Yeah, I, I actually the, my plan was a beach. Uh, now, uh, not like uh, many Israelis that after the military uh, that uh, going to a long uh, trip. I was after a long military. I immediately jumped into Intucell, and when we sold the company, I, I just got married to my wife, and I told her. Hey, we're going to go to, I want to kite surf in Brazil for a year. So it will be this just few months in Silicon Valley on our way to Brazil. She's, <laughs> she's still waiting. Yeah, eh? She's <laughs> 13, 13 years later, she's still waiting. <laughs> That's rough, dude. What did you see there that, that made you want to change your plans? I'm a, I'm a full stack person by heart. When I say full stack, I'm not talking about actually software full stack. I'm talking about hardware, data, AI, computer vision, um, software, Etc. And when I met Mike, he's like, "Hey, we have one of the largest manufacturing on Earth, and if you are going to come here, I will let you use uh, this massive supply chain, manufacturing, and logistics uh, beast that we have that we have over here to build companies." You know, my head got spin super fast. I told him yes, very very fast. So I did not think too much. It's just a, a gigantic playground, and as a guy that liked to build, it was a dream. And what was it that you were supposed to do there? What did you end up doing? Yeah, I created this uh, team internally that called Lab9, still uh, uh, running there. And basically, our team was in charge to identify which uh, opportunities there is inside the big flex in order to go and build small special forces tech, tech team to go and solve this problem. Manufacturing automation, uh, supply chain software, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, a new MES, manufacturing execution software, a new shop flow. Uh, the ability to interact with our customers, connectivity. So we basically worked on on thesis and we went out and hired teams and built those companies internally to go after those theses. And so you do that for, for three years. And is this Bright Machines, like, the, is that connected to the time you spent over there? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Mike, uh, I flew to uh, Zhuhai, uh, one of the largest facilities of uh, Flex in China. There's about 80,000 people in the, on, on that campus, just to give you a sense. And here I am stepping into the floor and thinking I'm going to see all of these robots building Apple product and Cisco product and Johnson and Johnson product. And I step to the floor and I see long lines of people standing next to each other. And I'm asking the plant manager, where's the robots? And he's like, there's no robots. And I'm like, you want to tell me that we are building the most advanced electronics on earth by hand? And he's like, yeah, robots are not flexible enough to what we do. This was when, by the way, like a decade ago? 2013. And I, here I am telling that guy over there, I'm going to build a company <laughs> that's solving this problem. And he's like, Mr. Leo, good luck. Uh, so I was like, okay, let's go. Uh, so build the thesis, hire the core team, and start working on that while I was at Flex. That was like within Flex, like the spe special forces kind of project? Exactly. That way we call it originally AEG, the code name, Advanced Engineering Group. Um, we worked on that thing internally. I left in beginning of 2015 to start Eclipse. And then in 2017, came back to Mike and the Flex boards and say, hey, I want to carve out that team to a new company uh, that I will create it called Bright Machines. And that was the birth of Bright Machines. So walk me through even just starting Eclipse, like what makes you decide you're working in, in Flex, you've got like all like that full stack that you're talking about, and you've got this specific project, which ended up being obviously leading to something massive, but then you you decide to go start a fund. Why? Yeah, it's uh, I'd say a combination of three things. A, um, Tesla will start taking off. I saw the vision of what I believe the world is going to be, and it's basically a tech techno technology company that building a car. It's actually not a car company that's using tech. And this is the type of companies I love building. And I also saw that the public market value this company as a tech company, as a software company, although they have uh, back then negative gross margin until today, mid-teens. And it's because the size of the market that they are going after is incredible. It's a trillion dollar in US. And the team that they built over there was able to build a full stack company in order to go and transform uh, mobility. And I just, my vision is we're going to see a lot of Teslas and SpaceX and NVIDIA is being built across those physical industries like energy, supply chain, defense, et cetera. Like these are companies that are like tech first in terms of their mindset, but go after and deliver like from a business model, they don't look tech first, but in terms of mindset, they are. Exactly. 
And, you know, Apple is not a subscription, didn't start as a SaaS company. And NVIDIA did not start as a SaaS company. And for sure, Tesla, it's not a SaaS company. So not what Silicon Valley really like in the last 20 years, but this is where is my passion. And I saw that Tesla start taking off. And I saw that I think the market is shifting between geopolitics issues, shortage of labor, product changes, that the, the need of building those companies growing significantly. And as much as I love Flex and Mike and the team, I didn't feel like the right things for me is to build those companies inside a Fortune 500. I thought like the right structure should be a fund to build those companies. And so you wanted to do these kind of like hardware meets software, you know, old, old tech, that, that's what you're looking to fund. And, and what was the, like that fund, that fund one, 125 million, was it like seed stage, early stage? Like what kind of checks were you thinking you were going to write? When, when did you think you were going to play a super early stage, either us building the company by ourselves or writing or leading Seed Series A. That was the thesis. I remember that uh, uh, I was like, we will write $5 million into each company and it will be enough for those companies. I was wrong and about all of the magnitude, but it's fine. And yeah, we kind of, I left the beginning of the 2015 and in April started the film. And what led to such an incredible growth in AUM? Like just... You know, this is more about founders, but like this stuff's obviously, obviously adjacent and interesting. Like, but just high level, you know this, others might not. Like, raising a fund is really hard. I think the odds of raising a second fund are like 50%. Like, you know, the number of firms that raise five funds, I don't know what it is, but it's like 10%. Like, these are really small numbers. And yeah, if you're doing well, then the fund's sizes go up. But to start with a $100 million fund, you know, less than a decade, like eight years later, have $4 billion under management is not normal. <laughs> so like, I guess I'm curious, like, what happened in your case that allowed you to do that? I will tell you what, if you tell me in 2015 that in 2024, I will manage four and a half billion dollars and I will be a venture capital, I will laugh in your face. So would like, most people. So would most people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I never thought about myself as a venture capital till this day. Uh, and I didn't really imagine me many, you know, raising fund over fund and building a franchise. That was not the goal at all. My goal was like, I want to build a platform that they can build a lot of companies in the digital transformation. Well, chairman of Flex back then told me the best thing you can do if you wants to do it is to start a fund. And I'm like, starting a fund? Shit, I never invested a dollar in my life. But you know, I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur. It's probably like starting a company, right? I will find some investors and I will figure out the structure, how hard it can be. Turn out really hard, <laughs> uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, Unsight 2020. Did you have some really big winners in the, in that early fund that helped that kind of created a tailwind for later? Yeah, I mean, we we I said there are the other things that I think people underestimate. We got super lucky. Luck is a big portion of this business. We got super lucky that our thesis became mainstream, and you know, the largest companies in the world right now are full stack companies, right? Microsoft and Nvidia. Tesla and Apple, they're all companies that, uh, I mean, if you're seeing uh, where Meta is spending most of their money is on hardware, uh, not actually on software. So the most software companies went to a hardware. So we just got lucky that the thesis became mainstream. I also got lucky that I was able to attract much better talent than me to Eclipse. And I don't think you, you do need to be lucky with the people that you choose. And then we, were, we got lucky that we built a couple of companies that turned out being good outcome. We sold the uh, Six River 450 million to uh, Shopify like super fast. We sold Kendrick to Ocado. We took Outlet Public. We're taking um, another company public now and uh, out of that fund. Uh, we have Augury that doing uh, high teens, close to 100 million dollar in ARR in that fund. So we were just bought. Was we were lucky. So I understand these are like this is traditional VC or did you do some kind of incubation where you would come up with some ideas and find the teams around them? Build actually the first company that we built was Bright Machines in 2017. That was a purely incubation. From 2017 till today, we built about three companies every year, and give and it depends on the year. I would say it's like two to four. So then walk me through Bright Machines because even that, like I understand the idea was seeded before, right in your flex days. But you know, for a venture fund that now you're two years old, you've all probably already done quite a few investments, then decide to get into the incubation game. Uh, that I mean, it's, it's quite a leap. Like as much as, you know, like I work with like all the VCs, they all have ideas, right? But then you're actually going to say, okay, like, I'm going to change my model. I'm going to get in it. Like I'm, I'm going to do the work. 
So like, how, how does that thinking, you know, kind of happen? In a very traditional me way, I'm not thinking too much. I'm just going and doing it. <laughs> it seems to work well for you. I don't know. You know, not always. I had, you know, not always. I was going to say, ask my wife about it. We were obsessed. We, a lot of us here came from the manufacturing background. Greg Ryko led the Tesla operation and manufacturing team. Myself, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, and G10 that came from Rivian and Tesla and SpaceX and others. So we always being passionate about manufacturing. And we are very thesis driven. We love, as all of us as an operators, we write investment thesis, many tens of them every year. We're just getting obsessed by idea and we will go and write for ourselves investment thesis. Even if we never find a company in that space, we'll just go. And I put a memo about uh, electronics manufacturing and I told them, in my lifetime, people are going to design iPhones and GPUs in a different way and they're going to manufacture them in a different way in the way that has been done in the last 50 years. And we kind of talked about the thesis and I say, this is not fair just to be uh, upfront. I actually created similar team on that in my previous life at Flex. I went to see McNamara, the CEO, and I say, hey, I want to carve that team that I originally built into a new company. He said, no, no, you lost your mind. But uh, le- le- we're never going to like, like, that. Yeah, what's, what's the upside for him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, no. Uh, <laughs> and, and I convinced him why it's a great idea for Flex and for us and for those people and everyone. And yeah, in doing that. Were they, was the idea that they would get like, I guess, a piece of that new co or something like that? Exactly. And and my and that point to, to, for me to him is like the company will require many hundreds of millions of dollars and you at Flex cannot spend that money on AI engineers and robotics engineers and computer vision engineers. This is not the margin profile that Flex has. And why did you decide, like oftentimes when this happens, the typical playbook at least is you might create that team, you kind of you have the idea, you create the team, and then you quickly put a CEO on it. But you kind of stayed at the head of it. Why did you choose to do that? Yeah, I'd say uh, um, it's not always the case when we build, we also staying the CEO for a long time. I think we the goal here is to find uh, much more capable people than us to take it. Uh, and we're doing that very often. I would say that I am incredibly passionate about this problem. It was hard for me to give away, uh, I'm working on it, uh, uh, to give away the uh, the room to someone else. So you finally convinced them you have this team. How many people? About 170 people they want. Oh, wow. Okay. I was thinking like five or 10 people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it has to come with like that because the first round was in the hundreds of millions, right? 180 or so. Okay. So it had to be that way because 170 people, I mean, you need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. And the other thing, it's a lot of chicken and eggs. If you are going to start with two guys in a presentation, none of the largest companies in the world is going to let you touch their mass production product. So actually, if you want to create the transformation, you almost need to have a certain scale out of the gate. How do you get that chicken and egg going? First step, Flextronics, yeah, okay, fine. We can do this new code thing. You can take these people. Okay, you got the people. You need the money and you need like the, I guess, design partners or something like that. How do you get those other two pieces? So what I did uh, when the carve out, uh, I also agree with Flex that they will be our first design partner as a okay, customer. Nice. So we signed multi-year agreement with them as a first customer. So with that deal, that they signed with them, I turn to an investors and I say, hey, I'm going to create uh, the next Foxconn or whatnot. It's going to be a $100 billion company, um, hopefully one day. And for that, I need a lot of money. And by the way, I have this amazing team and amazing customer. And I got the investors and, you know, kind of start running fast. And I got a lot of calls from my LPs of like, what the heck are you doing? You're not supposed to build company. You're supposed to invest. And I told them, listen, I... This um, this is who I am. I'm just incredibly passionate about building company. I cannot stop myself. When you talk about that deal with Flextronics, what is that deal, right? On the one hand, it, like how, in terms of revenue, what does it look like? But also, what are the kind of milestones or checkpoints that, you, that that are part of that kind of construct? How do you set that up? I would say I never did a carve out before, so I was like, learn. Uh, I was flying the plane while learning it. Uh, but you know, I figure out that the way that it that you do it is you have the people. So there is a lot of work with the HR figuring out who is this people will be best, the entities, all of that shit. Uh, there is all of the IP, everything that these people developed till today, source code, IP, patents, uh, trade trade secrets. Um, there is all of the equipment. We had tons of lines and robots. So like, where is the equipment? How much to value the equipment? And then it was a lot of negotiation with Flex of what's going to be the valuation of the new company because they are going to get 10% or whatever I can't remember 
uh, of that new company. So I spent a lot of time with lawyers and uh, negotiating these things, but uh, it was my first uh, carve out. I never did because it's almost like an acquisition. I mean, you're funding it with new equity, but you're almost like acquiring these people and this team and these equipment from Flextronic. Exactly. And then from a design partner perspective, like what did that business deal look like? We signed, um, we actually got, I think we did a really good job understanding that we need Flex to provide us a couple of uh, low tens of millions of dollars in revenue every year uh, for the next couple of years. So we can just focus on them rather than go out and trying to sell to the whole world to help us get the product roadmap of where it needs to be. Because it was clear to me that those guys uh, and, and, and ladies worked on that problem inside Flex, but the vision that we had of where we want Sprite Machine was not exactly the same. So we actually need to take that core, and it, it was obvious that we would need a couple of good years of actually building uh, what we call smart skills, and basically that's the AI brain of those robots, uh, uh, all of the control, the computer vision, the cloud, the data, the recipe as a code, our digital twin. It was a lot of developments, and I did not want to spend time on a go-to-market in the first couple of years. So Flex was just a great a partner for us uh, as we were building that in parallel. And what, yeah, like what are they, like they're paying tens of millions of dollars in revenue. You know, you have 170 people. Did they, was there already a product kind of that was in market at production level, and you just wanted to build on that? or were they paying No, it was, it was really early. Basically, what we carved for them was uh, what we call BRCs or Bright Robotic Cell, and it will, it's a very flexible robotic cells. That's essentially what those people build internally at Flex, and they will just replace manual processes with those BRCs. And we took the hardware and on top of it, build a ton of software that allow us to now not only replace people with single skills, but also to, to transform how the manufacturing flow looks like from an end-to-end process. And also to give those ro- robots the same granularity of flexibilities as humans have because the lines are changing what they're building all the time and this is the opposite of automation historically historically robots was building just one product again and again and again and we here in the electronics manufacturing doing one f- one floor of manufacturing can build many tens of different products every year and was there like like they're going to pay tens of millions of dollars and for X amount of years, like are they saying, okay, and then this year I need this many robots or I need this percentage of automation done or what was like the thing that they were paying against? You know what I mean? Yeah, we did. It's a great question. We actually did not know. So that was the hard part and we almost agreed that we will partner an X amount of dollars and then during the year we will identify through an SOWs what will be the specific needs of each of their factories They have uh, uh, 200 factories around the world. I would say it did not work perfect. It actually was really hard doing the first couple of years because some of those um, sites had needs that we did not want to work on because it was not aligned with our roadmap. But then, you know, Flex say, but hold on, but we commit. If you want the dollars, you will need to do it. So I would uh, say overall, it was a positive partnership, but it was not perfect. But it was almost based like, 99% then on trust, right? Like there's no way somebody from the outside could come in and pitch this to the CEO and be like, yeah, okay, let, let's do it. Uh, and 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 it works amazing in the first two years and then Mike left. It's got much harder with the new leadership, nothing about uh, those people, but it's more like I did not have the same trust I had with Mike. But yes, you a thousand percent right. It was pure trust game. Because there's no way you're getting, I mean, you got like, they all, they got upside ultimately, but the amount of risk they took up front was pretty massive, right? And like the amount of leeway that they gave you in the way that you described that that business deal, that contract, you know, the only reason that makes sense, I, I think, like looking at it from the outside is he just thought, you know, you would make it happen. You and that team would ultimately, you know, put something together that was valuable for them. And remember, it's a $30 billion revenue company. They don't care what the equity is going to be worth. It's anyhow below the line for them. He was doing that because mainly, I believe, you need to ask him, um, because he was he believed this industry is going to change and he felt that if Flex will be part of the company that will change these industries, it's worth positioning them in a way that uh, they would not feel like they were GM or Ford and Tesla just being created and they were not part of it. And by the way, maybe you can walk me through like just an example of like, I'm kind of totally an outsider to how these chips are being made. Like you talk about these manual processes and in my head, like I have an image of people like putting things on chips or whatever, like walk me through like 
maybe an example of the sort of processes that you're automating these days? Yeah, maybe let's just take this uh, AirPods case uh, as as a as an example, not because we're building it. It's just uh, will be an example. So uh, here in this AirPods um, case, uh, you have a couple of parts. You have the plastic housing that will be injection mold. Um, you have multiple of PCBA that will be the electronics cards that's sitting in this thing, and maybe you have some metal or magnet here and some lighting. Uh, the way that it works today, Apple will go buy chip from TSMC. They will take those chips, will ship them to someone like Foxconn. Foxconn have two sides of the line. Um, the first one um, will be um, uh, what's called SMT. And this is those high-speed machines that will take those chips and will put them on the board. The front end of electronics manufacturing is pretty much fully automated already. So this is putting chips on the PCBs. and On the PCB. PCBs, exactly. Now you take out PCBs and now you need to take the plastics piece, the PCBs, the magnets, the lighting. It's called the backend, the assembly and the subassembly. That's 98% human-based today. And, and my vision was like, I want the front, the backend to look like the front end. I want to create those robots that will... And the reason for it, I would assume, is that putting chips on printed circuit boards on PCBs is a bit more, is a lot more repetitive than, than what you call the, the, back, the backend manufacturer. What's the reason that that was automated so much faster? A good question. Is the variety of what happening in the front end is much less. And at the end of the day, you're always going to pick a chip and put them on a board. That's it. That's the job. And you need to do it really fast. Then things in the back end, I mean, think about this MacBook that we are talking from, this AirPods and a GPU. They all look so different than each other, meaning the assembly of those products looks very different. I see. And so what what does that world look like uh, when you start the company, you know, eight, eight years ago or so? For all of the... All of the humans, uh, uh, basically, it's like a, the majority of this industry is close to 100% will be people. And it will be a label, label arbitrage game, meaning you will try to find the places that have a cheap label, put a lot of them next to each other, build those products, put them on a boat, ship them to your customers and do it again and again and again. And that's still split. Like if you take the AirPod case, it's a great example. Everybody's still just doing one piece of the puzzle and moving it to the next person. Or how, how is that kind of usually split up? Usually in the case of uh, the airports, because, you know, it would be very large companies like Foxconn and others, they do a lot of those processes end to end, but it's, they will basically will have one factory is doing the injection molding, one factory is doing the SMT, one factory is doing the assembly. They will build the finished product, put it on a box and will ship it in, on a boat to whoever's the customer. But I mean, within the assembly, I imagine like all these humans and they're all just doing one part of the assembly. They're like clipping this, moving to the next person in the line. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I did not understand the question. Yes. Basically, you will have these extremely long conveyor belts and you will see people standing next to each other and across the things. And each of them is going to do one task. Someone just putting that screw. Someone just putting that label. Someone flipping the product. Someone, yeah, like scanning. It's just one by one. Uh, they will do those processes. Now, with Bright Machines, the goal wasn't so much to take, you know, one piece, let's say flipping it and create a robot for that. It was to create robots that could do, that could be reprogrammed, I would assume, and kind of for this AirPods, you're going to do that. But then for the next thing, you're going to do something else. That was kind of the, the hypothesis or the goal, I, I should say. Exactly. We wanted to do the process end to end. And in our line, there is still some people, we are working in a hybrid because there is things like cabling that maybe will not make sense to do with robots. And he wants the humans to do it. But the other issues about humans is we don't collect data when humans build products. When you start using robots, you collect a lot of data that maybe you never had around the, how much force you're putting and how that's potentially hurt the PCB and it will fail down the road. So what we start finding when we start creating this uh, robotic solution for multiple of steps in the process, we start getting insight that those insights will be relevant to the customers to how they should design the next product. So you're not just, like the ROI isn't just cheaper cost to produce, it's also around product quality and, and things kind of further down downstream. We take the whole data from our manufacturing lines and we tell our customers the supplier quality of the parts that they are buying. We tell them the quality of the product, how many we produce, 
uh, what was the cycle time. Uh, we feed the whole data back to our design for automation engine. So while they're designing a new product, we have a generative AI engine that's learning constantly to hopefully one day we'll be able to build the most perfect product. So you're basically catching um, the, the from both of the barbells, from the design of the products to the manufacturing of the products and just connect the data across the board. And it's incredible. We are finding insights that is just incredible. So going back to those early days, now that I understand kind of the scope a little more clearly, how do you, you're working with Flextronics, like, and I know the concept of MVP doesn't make as much sense here, but you still have to somewhat constrain the problem and say like, this is the part that we're going to solve first. How do you do that? What do you go after first? We start very simple of forget about end-to-end process, forget about the foundational model for robotics. We start with, can you be as reliable as a human can be doing electronics manufacturing tasks. Just start there. Just putting screws, just putting dims, um, just putting heat sinks, just putting CPUs, just do welding here, just do gluing, uh, scanning, the, th- the tasks that you will do very often in manufacturing. And the hardest thing about uh, Bright Machine is the people that, that our comparison is not in other startups, so it's a big company, it's humans. And actually, humans are pretty good. And then the return of investment needs to be very attractive for these people because, you know, they know how much a human costs them. Now, they're struggling to find those people. There is incredibly high attrition. They want to onshore manufacturing, so they cannot have the same amount of people they had in China. But the gold standard is this amazing machine. It's called human. And so what you're doing is you you take a subset of like activities, like processes, like let's say putting screws, flipping something, and you go after those and you try to match or exceed, let's say, human performance. Exactly. So we started in the first couple of years just matching. Can we do the same unit per hours as a human? Can we do it in the same quality as a human? And then we start, oh, we actually can do more per hour than a human. Oh, we can actually do in a higher quality in humans. And then we say, okay, can we do now two processes? So the one robot will put screws, the other robots will do pick and place. Now we measure the cycle times instead of two humans, two robots, and we'll basically grow that floor uh, um, as, as we are progressing with the roadmap. You know, one question that comes to mind is like, so I had a hardware startup before, it didn't end up working, but I'm familiar with some of the issues of building, of building hardware, working with hardware, just like how frustrating that could be sometimes when things aren't working. In your case, like, the, the opportunity is massive, but also the stakes are really high because, you know, you struck this deal, you didn't start from zero, you started with all these people, all this money, all this stuff, things really got to work. Like, were there times in the early days where, you know, whether things were very behind schedule or whether there were parts that you're like, shit, I wonder if we're actually ever going to be able to do this. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if this ever going to be realized or was it just kind of like pretty, pretty smooth sailing? I still have that feeling. Uh, so, you know, it's <laughs> like... Uh, we rarely meet the timeline uh, and we almost always late to what we commit or will do. This is incredibly hard. But the thing I'm getting excited is just our fleets of robots in the field um, is growing to hundreds of hundreds of hundreds. And we start showing things that the customers never imagined we will be able to do like we find problems that they never thought that they have or we help them optimize their process in a way that they generate so much more servers for ai or or whatnot is our customers are building so i think we are now in the inflection point and we now the platform is robust enough but yeah i had many of those thoughts along the way i also had some thoughts you know hey this was a good idea to start with this type of a scale rather than me starting the company is like I usually do it with five five guys and a dog. Um, and, it, you know, I, I till this day, I'm not sure that I'm exactly certain about the answer. Were there any, like, you know, again, because the stakes are so high, the burn is is, is high, and you kind of, you had COVID that, that happened through this. I don't know what that effect oh, was. COVID, COVID was almost killed us. Um, COVID was brutal. Um, you know, we're a full-stack company. We work on the robots with our software and our ML team. It's, you can't do that things from remote. Now, on the flip side, is show vulnerability of humans in manufacturing. So the need of robotics 
went to the roof post COVID, but COVID was really hard for us. Were there times where you had you were really tight on cash, really <laughs> tight on runway? <laughs> I don't know how much uh, we want to share uh, in this podcast, but uh, we had the situation of weeks. Wow. And I'll tell you one more thing. At the peak, we were 700 people, and now we are about 200. So, you know, it's oh, not... Wow. Uh, uh, and we figure out that we actually need less people, but we need people to be more in our HQ in San Francisco than maybe we had around the world. So it's not always rosy and up to the right. We... When were, you, a, when were you 700 in what year? Um, we were 700. We almost spac the company about uh, two and a half years ago. And kind of in the last moment, I decided that we're far away from being a public company ready. And I pulled the plug and said no to a very large financing and needed to do some significant drifts. That was not, not fun. Probably a good idea to not not go down this path route with uh, hindsight in mind. Hindsight looks brilliant. That's right. That's right. But it, but you know, it's funny. Like you know, the thing about weeks like resonates just because that's one of my biggest, let's say, learnings or whatever you want to call it, which is like just how many companies that are either successful or like from the outside look like very much on the path to success went through times where you know you could have flipped the coin. <laughs> Like, and it'd be dead, right? And there's another world where it, this company doesn't exist anymore. I, I had the privilege to build, to meet both Elon and Jensen. And Elon told me a couple of, they had four or five times at Tesla with weeks in cash. And he was like begging to the states of California to give him a loan. And without that loan, there was no Tesla today. And Jensen liked to remind me that uh, NVIDIA was overnight success of 32 years of hard working. I told them, you know, our very first call, I told them, ah, God, uh, I'm only seven years into it. Do you think I can do it faster? They're like, good luck. Yeah, if you can, let me know <laughs> I how. Tried, yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> That's wild. And, you know, another question I have is around just the, the business model, right? So you mentioned you have hundreds and hundreds of robots. Is this like a CapEx thing? They pay a few million dollars for a robot or is this like a kind of robot as a service type of model? We do both. Uh, we have a CapEx model plus subscription on the software as well. We have a robotics as a service model. And tell you the truth, I literally just talked with the board last week on that. Um, I yet to figure out the right business model, although we are doing many tens of millions in revenue. So, you know, I think still we are learning what should be the long-term business model of this company. And is that more from what makes most sense for you or just like in terms of what resonates with customers? Like, do you find some customers prefer the robot as a service model, but others are more used to just buying equipment? Or how's the market respond to that? The market, I think the market is careless because our customers are Fortune 100. They have so much cash on their uh, balance sheet. So I actually less, I think my point there is less about the market. It's just, I believe if we are successful, someone is going to his CAD to design a new AirPods. While he's designing that AirPods, our software we run on the background of the CAD and tell him what he needs to change in order for that things to be designed for automation. Once he's done, his manufacturing engineers is going to get a file that will, with, in our simulation tool that sits on Omniverse, you will be able to design the lines. Once he's done, you will be able to press a button and a new file, we call it recipe, is going to go into 30 factories around the world that building your product with our robotics. And the robots will reconfigure themselves and will know now how to build this new product. And once they are building this product, they're going to ship you all of the data back of how they're doing. We are far away from what I just described, but uh, we are making significant progress. And I think if we will do what I just described, my guess our business model will look different than what, what it is today. It has to. It has to because you think like the way I think about your business today and and I'm probably wrong, but just from the outside, you're like, okay, you got robots. Like that's the core thing, right? But when you when you talk about the way you described it, the value offering is very different than a robot. And so you got to price it completely different. Exactly. The robots for us, it's uh, people think about it as a robotics company. We are not a robotics company. Uh, we are a next generation manufacturing company. Robots are part of our stack. Um, exactly right. So yes. Um, so TBD on the business model. Cool. Well, listen, we'll we'll stop it there. I mean, you've raised at this point, like I said, over 400 million degrees. The last round was $100 million, just over $100 million uh, a few months ago. You had this fact thing that almost happened. So I think there's there's a lot of crazy things that, that haven't happened yet. But, you know, I expect uh, some, you know, 
to see this name, Bright Machines, for sure in the future. Let me just ask kind of the last two questions that we always end on. The first one, and it's a weird one for this one, but like, when did you feel like you had true product market fit? I had the privilege during this job to meet the CEOs of the loudest companies in the world. And they do not need to give me, I'm nobody, they do not need to give me their time. And when I heard from them, their challenges around manufacturing and saw in their eyes what we are describing that they are doing, how it's going to impact the largest companies on the globe, I knew that we are touching a product market fit. And then the last question is, if you could go, and especially because you've worked with so many other founders, given what you do at Eclipse, you know, what are some of the most common pieces of advice that you find yourself giving to founders in those really early kind of zero to one stages? You know, it's the cliche about being customer obsessed and people are telling me that all the time. And then when I'm digging in, they're not. And I think, you know, um, Flex was an, an incredible design partner for us and then one of the largest hyperscaler. Without these people, I think we would not be able to understand what we need to build well. This industry, especially physical industries, if you just build it that, it's not mean that they're going to come. You need to constantly iterate on the product and we are still constantly iterating on the product and you cannot do it without having a few very strategic customers that are Fortune 100, 500, and that you are, are truly listening to what they have to say about their, their business. What, like to you, what is it? Like, because customer obsessed gets thrown all the time. And it's one of those things where, like, it's kind of like what you said, like, there is no founder that's going to be like, ah, I'm not customer obsessed. Fuck that. <laughs> you know, like, they all, so what does that look like to you? What does it really mean? Till this day, some of my top engineers, uh, our customers will come and say, oh, I want this or that. And they're like, oh, they don't understand. I'm like, Stop it right now. These people are Fortune 10. They will understand their business. We are nobody. So even if we disagree, we are going to take their feedback and understand. We might decide to go elsewhere, but we are going to take that feedback and we will never say they do not understand what they're talking about. So I think it's just embedded that in the culture, um, especially when you're like in a deep tech engineering organization that, you know, 80% of my team are engineers and PhDs and smart people around uh, AI and computer vision and software and robotics. It's critical. Perfect. Well, Lior, thanks so much for jumping on the show. It's been awesome. Pablo, great to be here. I just gave you content that you liked so much, you actually listened to the end. And guess what? You didn't pay a single dollar. Not only that, I didn't even put any ads in your face. So you just got a bunch of content for free. And now that I've delivered that value, I'm asking for something in return. Open your app, open Apple Podcasts, open Spotify, open whatever app you use to listen to this and hit that follow button. It's actually going to help you because it's going to help you make sure you don't miss out on the next episode, which you like so much that you listen to the whole thing.